lied about it. He stole the story of a young murdered Michigan woman. He purposely altered it. He made himself the hero of it. He made up a story about her family. He then exploited them as an excuse to try to turn local cops into his own private paramilitary police force. He lied about it. Or his dementia or aphasia or insanity or whatever specifically does not work right in his brain is now so bad that he read about the poor woman in the New York Post, the New York piece of shit post. And he could no longer tell the difference between what he had read and what had actually happened. Or both. The New York Post, Monday, Ruby Garcia had a smile that illuminated the room or contagious laughter. Trump, Tuesday. Now Ruby's loved ones and community are left grieving for this incredible young woman, remembering what they called her. They said she had just this most contagious laughter. And when she walked into a room, she lit up that room. And I've heard that from so many people. I spoke to some of her family. There are scumbags in this world. And then there is Donald Trump. He did not talk to anybody in her family and his lie or his delusion or his lie and his delusion continue to echo through the Grand Rapids area. Ruby Garcia's sister confirms no one in her family talked to Trump. Of course, she can't know whether he hallucinated about that or just lied. She simply is angry. She is angry at Trump's fabrication and angry at Trump's fixation, his fixation on undocumented immigrants, as if they committed every crime in this country. She is angry that Trump has exploited her late sister and their family, quoting, the focus should be on my sister right now, who she was in life. And completing this nauseating episode, when pressed about why Trump said he had spoken to the family when he had not and was actually reading virtually word for word from the New York Post. This from NBC News, quote, the Trump campaign declined to comment on the record. A source familiar said the campaign keeps the details of whom he speaks to and the contents of the conversations private unless the family agrees to share them. Which is itself another lie, because if her sister is wrong, and Trump really did speak to some eighth cousin who just happened to say exactly what the New York Post had written the day before, he did not keep the contents of that conversation private. And of course, it is not like this is the first time Trump has taken the life of a murdered young woman, exploited it, turned it into a weapon against an ethnic group, turned it into a weapon to justify racism and unthinking hatred and authoritarian measures. He did it last month in Georgia to the murdered college student, Lakin Riley. There, the family did talk to him, and he rewarded their generosity. However misguided or naive you or I might think it, it was generosity, and he rewarded their generosity by autographing a photograph of the late Lake and Riley, and on it, spelling her name wrong. Legally, the Trump fronts have actually been quiet, though we have the revenge of Juan Mershon now. No, he will not delay the Stormy Daniels hush money election interference trial again past a week from next Monday. So Trump can wait for the Supreme Court to fail to invent presidential immunity and thus make Joe Biden king. 
There is also the further clarification that Jack Smith has indeed warned Judge Eileen Cannon that if she does not drop this nonsense of having both legal teams write competing jury instructions over a key point in the espionage case, the one she is too legally stupid to decide for herself, if she does not forget this coin flip and rule on the goddamned thing already, Jack Smith will take a writ of mandamus, a demand that she do her damn job and correctly this time to the 11th circuit and get her recused from the case so nothing really legal unless you consider the constitution of the united states and trump's efforts to you know terminate it like kind of legal ish a follow-up now to my synopsis here tuesday of the piece by peter tonjet spelled tongue it in a magazine called the American Conservative that matter-of-factly demanded the repeal or the bypassing of the 22nd Amendment and its constitutional requirement of presidential term limits, because clearly, said Mr. Tonjit, its authors did not mean for it to apply to a president who had served two non-consecutive terms. Lisa Needham at the public notice site connects two dots I had missed. She writes, the American conservative is a, quote, partner, unquote, of Project 2025. Project 2025 is a $22 million political purity arm of the Heritage Foundation. And you remember the Heritage Foundation. They are the owners and operators of the Supreme Court. Everything in the Trump Reich is connected. That goes without saying. But the direct link between the magazine that just casually confirmed Trump and the fascists' intent to keep him in office through at least 2033 or longer, if they can get away with it, the connection between them and Project 2025, the group pledged to get 50,000 government employees fired and replaced by card-carrying party members personally loyal to Trump, this is a stark reminder that this is all part of a coordinated plan and that these two dots Ms. Needham has connected are lethal ones. Project 2025 exists to replace the, quote, deep state, think of the trademark logo here, and the American conservatives' new thrust against presidential term limits exists to preserve Americans' freedom, TM, to elect anybody they, quote, damn well feel like it, TM, in a triumph of democracy, TM. All of which is true, provided you view the deep state and freedom and democracy as mere trademarked brand names, because a plan that wipes out the institutional knowledge and the institutional norms and the institutional proprieties of the day-to-day workings of the American government and replaces it with people with no experience and no skill and nothing but blind fealty to a madman who decides whether or not they get their paycheck this week, that is not replacing a deep state. It is, in fact, building a deeper and a more deeply incompetent state. And... A plan that also wipes out elements of the Constitution on a funhouse mirror version premise of freedom and democracy, TM, weeks after the Supreme Court already staffed, wiped out one element of the Constitution, namely the 14th Amendment. That is, in fact, the end to freedom and the means to murder democracy. And we haven't even drawn in some of the figures in the hundred other organizations like the American Conservative that are also partners of Project 2025, which is like saying they're partners of Stalin or Idi Amin, like Russell Votes Center for Renewing America. The Center for Renewing America, the Ministry of Truth, which is to eliminate everything in government that is not controlled by a church somewhere, is paralleled by Stephen Miller's America First Legal, which is currently on a binge to eliminate diversity by going to court and suing diversity into the ground, suing CBS, claiming a writer for a show called Seal Team was fired because he was a straight white male, suing the National Football League because it requires teams to interview, not hire, just interview minority candidates for vacant head coaching positions. Axios reports Stephen Miller, 
a worm in a suit is poised to reposition civil rights in his Justice Department to make it end what he calls and it calls, quote, affirmative discrimination. Trump's spokes wrestler, Stephen Chung, added that Trump is, quote, committed to weeding out discriminatory programs and racist ideology across the federal government. One wonders if Chung knows about the CBS poll from last fall indicating that 58 percent of Trump voters believe people of color are advantaged over whites. Poor Chung. If Trump gets elected, the government may deny him the job he already has. And then with Trump in charge, he would probably have to announce his own firing. Project 2025 is the equivalent of a multinational conglomerate and a misnamed one at that. Project 1825 might be more accurate, while the Peter Tongit end of it is looking to go back to a time when the only thing standing between a president and a term circumscribed only by the length of his life was that quaint little custom started by George Washington, and George Washington's dead now. There is also the Emma Waters end of it at the other end of the spectrum. And who is she? She is the newest star on the Trumpist's forced birth firmament. Anti-abortion, you know. The media, of course, continues to misrepresent Trump's 15-week national abortion ban as some kind of moderate proposal. It's not moderate, and it's not national. There wouldn't be a national abortion standard whether at 15 weeks or 24, there would be outright bans in all the states that can get them enacted. And in the states where abortion remains legal at like 24 weeks, it suddenly wouldn't be legal at 24 weeks. That is where there would be a national 15-week abortion ban. After abortion, after mifepristone, after the Alabama ruling against in vitro and the continuing assault on it nationwide. This is where this Emma Waters comes in, starting in Michigan, where laws went into effect in January decriminalizing compensated surrogacy, letting surrogate mothers get paid or reimbursed for their expenses and time bearing another woman's child. Also, laws went into effect providing more legal protections for LGBTQ parents. Well, that's where Waters began her attack. And there is a twist here. The usual Project 2025 formula against families they don't like or family planning they don't like begins with lawsuits. The attack on surrogacy begins a little bit more subtly on what studies say about the long-term effects on the kids born through surrogacy. Ms. Waters herself writes that studies say, quote, Children born from surrogacy agreements of any sort do as well, if not better, psychologically than their natural born peers, unquote. How in the hell does that let the Trump Nazis go after surrogacy? Because Waters then says that, sure, the studies that have been conducted are all positive. But what about the studies that have not been conducted? No, seriously. Quote, there is a huge difference between no harm and no known harm. It is the same kind of melodious sophistry that let Peter Tongit insist that nobody alive when presidential term limits passed in 1951 could have had any idea about Grover Cleveland serving non-consecutive terms in the 19th century, oh, except the author of the amendment the congressman who was 16 when Grover Cleveland was re-elected. It's the same fluid nonsense that pleases the same low IQ Trump supporters that says, sure, the studies now say surrogacy only helps kids adjust. But what about the studies in the 23rd century? Like, sure, the Earth has revolved around the sun all these years. But what if next year... The sun revolves around the earth. There are few saving graces as the Republicans prepare to climax their 40 years of building up hatred, building out on racism, and building upon paranoia inside their own cult. 
all while the Democrats are busily, publicly, loudly, and seriously arguing over whether Trump really is a fascist, or if those of us who use the term now, if we are just diminishing the memories of the victims of fascism in Italy and Spain and Germany in the 30s by calling him that when perhaps he's not fully fulfilled the register. However, despite our stupidity, sometimes the Republican's right hand is too busy to know what its death hand is doing. What's on the ballot in November in Florida? A ballot proposition protecting abortion rights in Florida and a second ballot proposition expanding marijuana sales in Florida from for medical purposes to, hey, whatever. Which is when Democrats did something rather clever. Biden's campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, suddenly said her team saw a, quote, path to victory appearing in Florida. But is even the draw of protecting abortion and getting pot for your home and office, hot and cold running pot, is that enough to reshape the presidential election in God's waiting room? Before you answer that, campaign manager Rodriguez didn't say that, did she? She didn't say Biden now stood a chance or a good chance or even a remote chance of winning Florida. She said she saw a path to victory there. Well, you know what a path to victory in Florida would be? Getting Republicans to have to spend more of those campaign pennies that Trump is not spending on lawyers to defend a state he won by three times as large a margin in 2020 as he had in 2016. And there are Trump toadies, and there are Trump cultists, and there are Trump slaves, and then there are Congressman Guy Reschenthaler, and Michael Waltz, and Andy Ogles, and Chuck Fleischman, and Paul Gozar, and Barry Moore, and Troy Nels. And they have introduced a bill to rename Dulles Airport in Virginia Trump International Airport. One would think that after his debacle with the Trump shuttle, where he took the popular and profitable hourly flight service from New York to Boston, and in just two years and five months, he literally put it out of business One would think Trump would want to keep his name away from anything aeronautical. Still, in the spirit of bipartisanship, I have an alternate suggestion. Given his track record, given the need of a new name for the product in question, why not rechristen those Boeing 737 MAX 9s after him? The Trump 737 MAX 9 convertible, because if anybody knows doors falling off, it's Trump. Still ahead of us on this edition of Countdown, to paraphrase the old joke, 45 years ago, right now, the letter was in the mail. All it would do when it got there was change my career. Things I promise not to tell coming up. And yes, as I warned you, a slightly truncated format today and maybe tomorrow. Details on tomorrow to come. Colonoscopy. So somebody said, what kind of doctor goes into the colonoscopy business? So I said, I'm not going to cast any stones. I cover Trump for a living. It's basically the same thing, isn't it? First, still more idiots to talk about the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. We start with the bronze. Worst, Charlie Kirk, balloon head is back. That's right, old balloon head is back. 
speaking at the weekly conservative conference wherever the C PAP C PAC C PAC PAP PAP PAC balloon head conference they have to have these conferences weekly to keep conservatives in line and also to prevent them from possible accidental exposure to reality charlie kirk attended this one he does 87 of them a year he told the audience that women in their early 30s are quote not at their prime and quote not as attractive in the dating pool now before you think about complaining to somebody about this nitwittedness you ladies in your 30s don't need me to correct the record on this. Just ponder what Charlie Kirk's home life is now like. When they married, his wife was 32. Say, Charlie, is that a new beard? The runner-up, worser, Mike Davis, the Trump fascism legal eagle who makes Tom Fitton look like Oliver freaking Wendell freaking Holmes. He also hallucinates. I mean, by comparison, Stephen Miller is almost normal. Davis has now posted about the death threats against Judge Eileen Cannon, which haven't happened except maybe from Trump's lawyers, and, quote, Schumer physically threatening Gorsuch and Kavanaugh from the Supreme Court steps if they didn't rule Schumer's way on a pending case. Bad news, Mike. That, that, that also didn't happen. That, that certainly didn't happen in your awake time. That was in one of your dreams, Mr. Whackdoodle. But our winner, the worst. Oh my God, this is going to happen weekly, isn't it? It's one of my former Sports Center co anchors, Sage Steele, fired by ESPN for, well, for a decade of being too annoying for words and then going off on a right wing anti vax, this is my country because daddy was in the war crusade. First, she claimed that the devil hit her in the mouth with a golf ball to try to keep her from speaking her truth. Because, yes, you're important enough for God or the devil to bend the universe to talk to you, but only in a complicated metaphor that you could easily misunderstand, especially if you're a moron. Then... In her new talk show, Sage Steele leaned into her guest and touched his knee and asked, What is Joe Rogan's dream? And when he looked at her in shock and disgust, it took her about 10 seconds, and then she realized that her guest wasn't Joe Rogan, that it was the kickboxing promoter Dana White, that the only thing they had in common was that they were bald, middle-aged men. Now, Sage Steele has told Fox Digital that her interview with President Biden for ESPN in 2021 was scripted. Quote, I was told you will say every word that we write out. You will not deviate from the script. Like every single question was scripted, gone over dozens of times by many editors and executives. I was told not to deviate. It was very much, this is what you will ask. This is how you will say it. No follow-ups. The saddest part of this is that it has clearly never once occurred to Ms. Steele that this was done to protect her and to protect ESPN. Because if the interview with Biden had not been scripted, there would have been an excellent chance that she would have leaned in and said, what is Joe Rogan's dream? Um, 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 what is Joe Biden's dream? I mean... On one of the half dozen or so sports centers we did together, one of her interviews with a baseball player live after he won an award was completely scripted by the producers. I think it was when Clay Bellinger won the most valuable player award in the National League because everybody at ESPN knew. I mean, the interns in ad sales on day one, they knew that Sage Steele was a disaster waiting to happen. Clay Bellinger, MVP of the NL. What's... Joe Rogan's dream. In the interview with Fox, and oh God, is she perfect for Fox? Watch your ass, Jesse Waters. There's another person over the age of 21 with the mind of a four-year-old. Sage Steele went right to the fascist Biden age plot thing. Quote, when someone is struggling, we allow them to continue to be in the spotlight and put them out there in the first place when they knew there were issues? That is... 
almost word for word what a senior ESPN executive, a vice president, he may be a president by now, what a senior ESPN executive said to me after one of those sports centers we did together in 2018 or 19 about Sage Steele. When someone is struggling, we allow them to continue to be in the spotlight? We put them out there in the first place when, when we know there are issues? One last Sage Steele quote. I think it's really heartbreaking that the people who love Joe Biden and say they truly care about him have allowed it to get to this point. Sage, I know you. I know Joe Biden. Not only is his mental acuity 10 times yours right now, but so is President Lyndon Johnson's right now. 10 times yours. And Lyndon Johnson has been dead since 1973. Sage, it will never till the day she dies or gets hit by the next golf ball sent by the devil dawn on her that all she has said about Biden is actually a plea for help about herself steal today's worst. What is Joe Rogan's dream person in the world? This is Countdown with Keith Elberman. To the number one story on the countdown, a little early. I promised this episode would probably be a little short because of the impending medical procedure. Details to come. It's more a schedule issue than a health one. And an unconsciousness issue. I mean intentional unconsciousness, not like the normal type I have. But it's okay because the topic of my favorite topic, me, and things I promise not to tell, and the missive in question, one of the most important letters in my entire life, was in the mail, in transit to me, 45 years ago, right now. Plus, I just saw, after all these years, a photograph of the man who sent that letter, when he was a newscaster at WCBS Radio in New York, and he suited up in a Yankees uniform at a radio all-star game at the original Yankee Stadium in the summer of 1965. He looked serious and young. He was three months older than my dad was. And it was as startling to see him as it is still startling to read the letter he wrote to me. This is the story, and it is a long one, of the Adler letter and the hell through which I had to go just to read it. The Adler letter, falling into my hands on the night of Sunday, April 8, 1979, was like the postscript to a breathless 500-page novel that turns out to be a million times more exciting, more interesting, and more important than any of those 500 pages or the 500 pages combined. We had driven by that point around nine or ten hours. I do not believe I ever actually expected to die on the trip, but I was, at least a dozen times, absolutely convinced that George and I would wind up in the hospital. He and I were college seniors, gone home to see the defending two-time world champion New York Yankees open the 1979 baseball season, and then back on the road for the four-and-a-half-hour trip from the parking garage at Yankee Stadium to the rural wilds of Ithaca, New York. We had done this countless times, but I did not know as I got out of my dad's car and later on into George's that this trip had two previously unimaginable components. First, at that hour, the Adler letter had already been sitting in my mailbox at my apartment at 207 Delaware Avenue, Ithaca, New York, for at least one day, maybe two. And I did not know the other thing and only found it out as George told me about it at the ball game. His father had yelled towards him as George backed out of the driveway that morning. George, there's rain in the forecast. Drive carefully. Remember... I took off your snow tires because it's spring now. The midpoint of the trip to my school, Cornell, and his Ithaca College, more or less, was a McDonald's restaurant in Liberty, New York. 
and we stopped there and got a late lunch or an early dinner, and I was sitting facing the window, and George was sitting facing the counter, and as we ate and mumbled, I said, George, you have a really bad case of dandruff, or did it just start really snowing? George wheeled around to look out the window. Uh Uh-oh. We wrapped up our burgers and took them with us and literally ran to the car. My father and his goddamn snow tire obsession, George shouted. Within an hour, on the outskirts of Binghamton, New York, three or four inches of snow had reduced speed to just above single digits and visibility to next to nothing. George was a meticulously good driver. Didn't matter. We spun out a full 360, loop the loop. We're going north, oops, we're going west into oncoming traffic, oops, we're going south into the cars behind us, oops, we're going east into the ditch next to the highway, hoo boy, we're going north again. I think we spun out six or seven times on the highway alone before we got to Binghamton. There was some solace in seeing other cars in both directions doing exactly the same thing and concluding that George's father could not have had the time to remove all their snow tires, too. We were not far north of Binghamton, still skidding, still spinning, George swearing nonstop when he interrupted himself long enough to ask me what time it was. I had to hold my watch up to the car window to get brief flashes of illumination from the highway lights. A little after seven, we skidded again. George swore loudly. Put the Ranger game on. I do it myself, but we skidded again. By now, I was getting kind of used to it. I turned the radio literally before George regained control of the steering. I found the Ranger station, the one in New York, WNEW. If you had told me that night that a little over a year later I would be broadcasting on WNEW, my first thought would have been, so we don't get killed tonight? Because George's father took off the snow tires, that's nice. Oh, and I work there, and I'm not a ghost. If you told me that night that the Adler letter was waiting for me back in my snow-covered mailbox in Ithaca, I might have pressed George to go faster. And they might never have even found our bodies. The storm, as storms often did in those long-gone days, somehow boosted the AM radio signal from New York. And though we were 200 miles away from the transmitter, Marv Albert and the WNEW Rangers broadcast was clear as a bell. The traction even seemed to get a little better. But we both knew the ordeal that lay ahead. The exit from the highway at Whitney Point. It amazed us, as it amazes the students there now, as it must have amazed the students who went there a century ago, a century and a half ago, that Cornell University, which I attended, and Ithaca College, which George attended, were both an hour's drive away from the nearest highway. There was, in fact, no access to Ithaca, New York, by anything more than a two-lane road. It was legendary on the Cornell campus that old Ezra Cornell, the barely literate railroad tie preservative tycoon of the 19th century, decided to give away nearly all of his fortune, which today would have been at least a billion dollars, and he told a friend he was going to open a university where anyone can study anything. His friend reacted in horror. They will stampede the place. Ezra Cornell laughed. (laughs) <laughs> Wait till you see where I put it. Ezra Cornell's little geographical joke was still vividly alive 110 odd years later. The easiest of the routes to his university was the one that took you from Ithaca to Whitney Point. Whitney Point, the capital of the Metroplex there, Whitney Point, Lyle, and Center Lyle, also known as the Calcutta of Broom County, where nearly 3,000 people live atop each other in conditions so crowded that every person barely has his own square mile. Once you got off at Whitney Point, you were at the mercies of Route 79, where if traffic were light or the drivers adroit, you might make it back to Ithaca in 30 minutes. But if you got stuck behind somebody, it could be an hour or two. Or if there was an April blizzard and George's father had taken off your snow tires, it could take you longer than it took Antarctic explorers to reach the South Pole, and you'd see more snow and ice than they did. I believe George and I skidded making the left turn off the highway, but he managed to stay on the road. The radio signal was not quite as fortunate. Within minutes of leaving the highway, WNEW began to compete for space on George's car radio with some audible noise that the radio could suddenly pick up from his turn signals. 
make a right, and Marv Albert was being drowned out by a loud kick, 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 as in, Vickers cross the kick, 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 pot van slashes, click, click, click. Within minutes after the first spin out on Route 79, mercifully with literally no other cars on the road, the woo woos arrived. We never figured out what they were, but they waxed and waned so slowly that at first I asked George why Ranger fans at Madison Square Garden were chanting woo woo during the game. George was too busy swearing to answer. The snow was now horizontal, and as it danced towards us in George's headlights, it was hypnotic. And the Ranger broadcast now sounded like this. Vickers, Crossley, woo, 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 pot fan slashes, click, 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 damn it all to hell, woo, 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 Davidson holds with the same, woo, woo, son of a bitch. The trip from Whitney Point had taken well over an hour, and we were not halfway there yet when the inevitable happened. George kept a steady, slow pace, 10 or 15 miles an hour tops. He really was a great driver. He did not accelerate. He did not turn. Yet all of a moment, his green 1970 Dodge Dart decided to make an abrupt left at about a 45 degree angle. We were off the road in seconds and headed for an unscheduled visit to the front porch of a farmer's house that had to have been set back at least 200 feet from the road. Here, finally, the heavy snow worked to our advantage. It slowed us. Then it stopped us just two or three feet before we would have plowed into this guy's house. However, since we were in Richford, New York, birthplace of John Rockefeller, by the way, or we were in Caroline or Caroline Center or Slaterville Springs or wherever the hell we were, the homeowner emerged bearing not a gun nor an attitude, but genuine concern. In fact, he heard the Ranger game on the radio and asked me the score, which is when I noticed that the moment we had left the road, the woo-woos had stopped and the WNEW signal was as good as it must have been in Madison Square Garden in New York. The farmer helped us push the car back onto Route 79, and as we got in, he went and said, uh, where are your snow tires? George started to swear again. I took over and explained about George's father. Never been up here, has he? George started the car back up and now drove even slower. Within a minute, the woo-woos were back. Marv Albert and Sal Messina, woo-woo-woo, where the Rangers lead, woo-woo-woo. We got there, finally. George was actually going to try to drive up the hill that led to the other hill that led to the Delaware Avenue Hill, where my apartment was, calculating that I had pressed my luck sufficiently. I told him, just let me out at East State and Mitchell, and I'd make it from there on foot. Thankfully, George's father had not removed the sure grip soles from my winter boots. I actually went to my radio station first. It was literally a two-minute walk from there to my apartment. I lingered at WVBR for 15 or 20 minutes and then hiked back. The Rangers had won their game. From the station, I had called George's apartment, and he had made it back there. And I took my first deep breath since the McDonald's in Liberty. And I reflected that it was only six hours until my next class, and guess what? I was going to cut. I stomped off the snow on my porch at 207 Delaware Avenue, and I opened the door, and I dumped my bag inside, and then I reached into the mailbox, and I saw it immediately. The return address. Adler, WCBS, CBS Radio, a division of CBS Inc., 51 West 52 Street, New York, New York, 10019-212-975-4321. Lou Adler was Radio News in New York City in April 1979. And this was April 1979. I could barely breathe. The Adler letter. What was in the Adler letter, which explains why, five decades later, I know it by heart and can tell you exactly where it is at the moment. That's next. This is Countdown. Resuming the number one story on the countdown and the several lifetimes contained on Sunday, April 8th, 1979. 
I survived a nine or ten or eight hundred hour drive in a blizzard right after my friend's dad had helpfully removed the snow tires from my friend's car. I had lived to resume my desperate bid to graduate college in two months and get a job somewhere in radio in three months. And against all odds, amid all the snow and mess, there was a letter waiting for me at my apartment in silent, snow-inundated Ithaca, New York, a letter from Lou Adler, the news director of the leading all-news station in the United States of America. Lou Adler had begun on WCBS the year I was born. In 1967, the station went all news, and it immediately became the best all news station in the country. Lou Adler co-anchored the mornings, and eight years earlier, he had become the station's news director. He was the best. His co-anchor, Jim Donnelly, was the best. His sportscaster, Ed Ingalls, was the best. His reporters were the best. His weatherman was the best. His traffic guys were the best. His jingles were the best. I listened daily in high school and when I was home from college. I did not take literal notes, only mental ones. My college graduation, if I made it, was seven weeks away. I had never worked on television in any form, but I had been on radio two or three thousand times by then, and I thought I was pretty good at it. In the preceding months, I had flooded every radio station in every major market in the Northeast with a demo tape and a resume. I figured I might as well start in my home of New York and not eliminate a potential job, no matter how long a long shot it might have been. If I wasn't good enough to work there, I concluded, I should let the people who ran New York's radio stations decide that, since that's what they were paid to do. To this point, they had decided that by not responding. I got a few nibbles from some of the smaller stations, but as April 8th turned to April 9th, I had no job prospects. Other friends were getting offers in Waterbury, Connecticut and Laconia, New Hampshire. The thought of which, and nothing against either of those cities, filled me with terror. And now, after this ordeal by snow and without snow tires, after the WNEW woo-woos and George's father's near fatal decision to remove those winter tires, here in my hand was a letter from the man who was, to my mind, the best radio newscaster I had ever heard. Obviously, it would be a rejection. But even in that moment, even at my age, 20 years, two months, and change, I was awestruck, not only that Lou Adler had replied, but that he alone, of all I had written to, he had been the one who replied. I believe I did not remove my parka before opening the envelope. I did put on one lamp in my apartment, and I read WCBS, CBS Radio, a division of CBS Inc., 51 West 52 Street, New York, New York, 10019212975 April 3rd, 1979, Mr. Keith Ulberman, 207 Delaware Avenue, Ithaca, New York, 14850. Dear Mr. Ulberman, this will reply to your letter of March 27th, with which you included a tape of your sports work on WVBR-FM. Sometimes it's hard to know what a man can do by listening to a brief tape. I stopped. Wait, a man? Wait, wait, which... Which, oh me, I'm just a kid. Sometimes it's hard to know what a man can do by listening to a brief tape, but I must tell you, I was excited by what I heard of yours. I think you have exceptional talent and poise considering your age and experience. You read well and you write well and you know how to use tape. If the short tape is truly representative of what you can do, and if your knowledge of sports is broad, and if you can perform under pressure well, then I feel you have an excellent future in this industry. By this point, my heart was beating so furiously I could hear it. I was this close to hearing it make the woo-woo sound. I think it might be a good idea for us to meet. Let me know when you can make it to New York. I have nothing here for you, and I know of nothing solid, but if I feel as strongly about your potential after we meet as I do now, a meeting certainly could do you no harm. Sincerely, Lewis C. Adler, Director, News Operations and Programs, LCA slash PP. George, I screamed into the phone. Can we drive back to the city right now? He swore. I read George the letter. He paused. 
No, we, we shouldn't go tonight. You're not going to see him tomorrow. Wait till you get your appointment. But Jesus, this is like the manager of the Yankees asking you to stop by the stadium and bring your glove and bat just in case. I think I got to sleep at sunrise. I had read the Adler letter 20 or 30 times, and not until the 15th or so did I stop expecting it to have turned back into some courteous form letter rejection, badly Xeroxed and slightly off center. Slowly, it dawned on me that my own assessment of my radio skills were not predicated on ego or even the context of what else I could hear in Ithaca, which was then the 351st largest radio market in the country. Good, but still 351st. I cannot now describe the sense of validation except to say that I half seriously considered not taking Lou Adler up on his offer to meet him at CBS World Headquarters, BlackRock itself, where Bill Paley would be working upstairs. Because short of offering me a job, there really was no chance Mr. Adler could do or say anything more that could make me feel better or more confident that my dream of becoming a sportscaster would not lead me to starvation or to Laconia, New Hampshire. In fact, in person, Lou Adler found more things to say. If I had an opening for a sportscaster right now, I would seriously consider you for it. I would hesitate because of your age and your lack of practical experience, and then I'd probably do it anyway. He was as warm and supportive and informal as his letter had been structured and serious and tempered. Let me take you on a tour. We saw the live studios, the production studios, the writer's area. I wasn't just speechless. Again, I was breathless. And you should probably recognize this man by voice, if not by sight. Keith Olbermann, meet our sports director, Ed Ingalls. Ed, this is Keith. This is the fellow with the tape. Ed Ingalls took a moment, then his eyes widened. Hi, what a tape. Jesus, Lou, don't tell me you've hired him. Did you fire me? I must admit, I thought for a second it might have happened. I did not shrink entirely from that fantasy. Lou Adler laughed. No, Eddie. Then he paused. It was irresistible. Not yet. We went back to Lou Adler's office. Have you got any job prospects? I explained that a month earlier, thanks to a chain of recommendations that stretched from my internship at Channel 5 Television the year before, through a young ABC sports executive named Bob Iger, I think it was, to a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, I had met everybody at the radio network of United Press International, and I was supposed to go back and see them about working there freelance as summer vacation relief for the year ahead in sports and in news. Oh, that would be ideal for you. Lou Adler said. It's a tough place to work. They don't pay well at UPI, but it's here in the city, and every other radio station in this country will hear you on the feed. That's where we hired Ed from, Ed Ingalls. So if we have an opening, he smiled broadly, I can poach you and get you here in less than two weeks, can I? Mr. Adler then suggested that the CBS station in Atlanta would be needing a sportscaster in a few months. I'll stay on top of that. They already have a copy of your tape. I hope you don't mind. I made several copies of your tape. If UPI does not work out, I am confident you will be offered a job in Atlanta and maybe quite a few other jobs. I hope I've been of some help. Stay in touch. It's one of the privileges of this job to be able to help. But frankly, you're not going to need that much help. I may have taken the train back to my folks' house, or I may have just walked the 20 miles or floated. The UPI job worked out full-time two months later. At the first game I covered for money, I walked into the press box at Shea Stadium, and there was Ed Ingalls. Thank God you went to UPI. The way Adler went on about you, I seriously wondered if he was planning to bring you in and kick me out. The Atlanta offer Lou Adler arranged came. I turned it down. About a year later, I got a call from Adler's assistant saying they were going to need a new afternoon sportscaster at WCBS, and would I send a new tape? But by that fall, when the job opened, Lou Adler was leaving WCBS to become news director and vice president of another New York radio station, WOR. His successor would choose somebody else for the job. Just as I heard from the people who ran the radio network that the WOR folks had started the year before. It was not coincidental. Lou Adler had sent these people starting this new network, my tape. There is inevitably from the distant future a punchline. 
In 2006 or 2007, when Countdown had become the highest rated cable news program that wasn't on Fox, an email appeared in my inbox. I could not believe the name of the sender. Lou Adler. He began just as formally as he had in 1979. He actually felt it was necessary to remind me about his letter. He said he watched every night, and when he found other viewers of the program, he told them the story. Proudly, he said. He asked if I remembered. I wrote back immediately, remembered? Remembered? I told him I still had his letter, and I still had the sense of confidence it had given me that it was central to my decision to more or less give up my sports career at the age of 38 and try news. And I told him the whole driving back to Ithaca and the snow tire story just for fun. Lou wrote back again within minutes. He had just retired after running the mass communications program at Quinnipiac College, and he said he had had a strong sense of his career having been the proverbial punch into a pail of water. Now it was my turn to reassure him that the people like me whom he had supported and taught and broadcast to had long since begun to support and teach the next generation. And that generation was already supporting the one after that. And there would be people in this business beginning their careers after both of us were dead who would owe a debt of gratitude, whether or not they knew it, to Lou Adler, as I always will. Lou Adler died five years ago at the age of 88. There are letters and photos in the hallway that leads in from the front door of my home. They are from Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Joe Biden, and Lou Adler. done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend John Dean. Everything else was pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for this, the 217th day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,184th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment. Use the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system. Use the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Again, it might not happen. It might be abridged depending on this routine medical procedure. If the hospital issues a bulletin, don't look for a new edition tomorrow. Otherwise, bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.